Our scripture reading for this morning is found in the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. It is a common passage that is used and reflected on Easter Sunday. Let us see what the Spirit does with us today. John 20, beginning at verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linens wrapping there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen, lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head, the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary... And she turned and saw it and and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which affectionately means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, him that he had said these things to her. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word today. So today is Easter. Today is the day that we celebrate that the stone has been rolled away. Today is the day that we gather and say that the Lord has risen. He has risen <laughs> like that enthusiasm. And while, yes, it is a day of celebration, it is also a day of teaching and learning. You see, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior is the foundation on which all of our faith and hope is based. I've said it repeatedly throughout Lent. I will say it again. Jesus' birth would have meant nothing without his death. And his death would have meant nothing without the resurrection. Otherwise, we would just be, well, we wouldn't have a reason to gather in Jesus' name because nothing miraculous would have happened. Jesus was born, sent by God to come to the earth in human form to share the good news. He was arrested, he was crucified, he was laid in a tomb, and he rose from the grave. These words are familiar, as they may be, have echoed down through the ages, affirming the belief of every Christian, every believer. When we generally hear these words within church, spoken in tones of expected familiarity, these words in Christians that we have, words that we have known, that we've been born and raised with if we've grown up in the church, we can recite elements of the resurrection story by heart with very little thought with very little concentration. But what if we were reading and hearing these words for the very first time? Can you remember a time in your life when you did not know how the story of Jesus would end? Anybody? Okay, little one there. Okay, cool. 
I was born and raised in a Christian household. I can't answer that question. For one of the stories that my mother would tell me when I would go to sleep in my crib would be the story of Jesus. If you are like me, you have heard this story your entire life, and being able to answer the question, can you remember the time when you did not know how the story ends, is very, very, very hard to answer. In reality, we are a lot like Mary, for when we approach the empty tomb, we bring our assumptions, our teaching, our knowledge of the story with us. Mary came to the tomb fully expecting to see it as she had left it, sealed, closed by the Romans. Instead, she found that the stone had been moved away, so she ran to find the disciples and tell them what, they have, what had happened. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've laid him. Upon hearing this news, John does not tell us that she went into the tomb like Peter and the other disciple. Mary stopped at the vision before her, the rolled away stone from the opening, and she assumed she knew what had happened by these first impressions in that moment. How many of us are not equally as guilty? of doing the very same thing when it comes to our own faith in God, our own faith in Jesus, our own expectation of Easter, how we live and serve within the church. I know I do from time to time. I had a colleague who lived in downtown area of Albuquerque, New Mexico for a number of years. Near his apartment, there was a man who lived in a refrigerator box in the alley just one block away from his apartment. The, refriger the refrigerator man, as he was called, was dirty, unshaven, and stayed to himself. Now, my friend was admittedly afraid of him and took great care to avoid this man when, in, whenever he was out. Now, in my friend's building, there lived a man who loved cats, and in time, he became an acquaintance of the refrigerator man when he required a new kitten. My friend watched the neighbor help the refrigerator man, helped him clean up his act, so to speak, gave him an opportunity to wash and to shave. He helped the refrigerator man find a job. He would bring toys and treats for the kitten to have. And one day, my friend and the neighbor were talking, and the neighbor said, life is very very strange. I am surprised that the refrigerator man would take a job of a dishwasher and be grateful. A job that was completely below his education and abilities. My friend was shocked to hear this news. And in talking with the neighbor, he learned that the refrigerator man had a PhD in some field of physics. Because of a divorce and subsequent depression, his life had turned out in a very different way than he had expected and was currently living within his situation. Eventually, the refrigerator man worked long enough where he could leave the alley. He found an apartment, and for the next couple years, my friend did not see the refrigerator man. He thought about him from time to time and assumed that he had put his life back together, that he was doing some research in some physics department at some university somewhere in the U.S. But that assumption was destroyed when my friend walked into the very diner the refrigerator man had got a job in washing dishes and was still there, was very thankful to still be there. My friend, like me, is a pastor. He has the training of how to go out into the world to help folks to do his best not to judge them and to serve them where their needs are, to be a living, walking missionary of Jesus. But my friend, like myself at times, made an assumption about how things ought to work, only to be reminded that our assumptions when it comes to God are most often proven wrong. How many of us are guilty of making assumptions based on our own personal perceptions and stereotypes taught to us by our parents, taught to us by our friends, taught to us by our schools, taught to us by our society and culture, and whatever the latest TV ad that says, buy this so you don't have to do anything so you get great results? If 
we stop and assume that we know how another person feels or thinks without giving that person the opportunity to speak for him or herself, without approaching them, without asking questions, we are just as wrong as Mary. Mary saw the stone and accused them of removing Jesus' body. Now again, for a first-time reader or hearer of the story, they need to be reminded who the them are. And those are the people who sought to get rid of Jesus. The ruling Jewish body, the Sanhedrin, made up of Sadducees and Pharisees. These are people who had a particular lifestyle in which they upheld various teachings of the scriptures. They did not like the fact that Jesus was overturning things that they had been teaching for centuries. He interrupted in just a couple of years. It is not usual for people to expect certain actions from their, excuse me, is it not unusual for us to expect certain actions from our adversaries and to blame them with hasty uncertainty? Just when you feel someone's trying to get you and the motive that they're using, when you stop and look and ask a clarifying question, you realize, oh, I've read this completely wrong. We have a tendency to distrust and engage in animosity, which is based upon experience and past history. But not everyone looks at the same way of the world that we do. And for as many individuals that are in this room this morning are as many different individualized views of this world. The only thing that we can do is do our best to take that individualized life and bring it together as a body of Christ. But all too often, our distrust colors our perceptions. We teach the same distrust to others, much like politicians who spout some type of rhetoric to divide and lure voters to their sides. When the disciples came running to see what Mary was talking and crying about, they were able to go directly into the tomb and see for themselves, and indeed Jesus was gone. The stone no longer blocked their way of their vision. The tomb was empty. What blocks our view of seeing the risen Christ? What are the stones that block our vision? of seeing the beauty and the wonder of our God unfolding in our lives and the lives of others each and every day. A person reading and hearing this story for the first time would have great difficulty believing that a person could be dead and is now alive. This is something that we as Christians take on faith. And our job as Christians is to go into the world and make disciples and to think and try to approach it like them. Those who cannot see, those who do not understand what faith is. We are to strive to, through a, this resolve of loving others as Jesus loved us, so that we can help them see that the stone that is blocking their perception of accepting Christ can be easily rolled away if we let the Spirit work. Before us, as believers gathered today, we have to honestly look at ourselves and answer a very simple question. What is the stone that is blocking my journey towards a complete transformation into the person God has created and called me to become? Through finding the empty tomb, the gift of salvation, the acceptance of Jesus as our Lord and Savior, going through the waters of baptism, we become Christians. We become new creatures that have been given themselves to God, to believe God's wisdom and truth and loving promise by letting go of our need to be like everybody else that this society tells us we must join and be a part of. For me personally, In those moments when I see my faith wax and wane, it is when my trust in Jesus God and the Holy Spirit is not as strong as it should be. And in those moments, I have to stop and look and see what are the stones that I am using to block 
my ability to see, feel, hear, and encounter my risen Christ. I'm setting up boundaries that keeps God out of my heart, my soul, my mind. The easiest for one, for me, is money. When the financial bubble burst so many years ago, like many others, I watched my retirement go down to nearly nothing. And oh yes, I recognize that I am young and I have years to build it up and there are those that were worse off than I had, that, that I were worse off than me, but I will now have to work twice as hard to build it up, whereas before it was quite a bit easier. Now, I have to strive to trust Jesus completely, but when it comes to managing my time, how to raise my son, to respectively cherish my wife, when I pray to deal with my adverse ad adversaries and study God's word, it's easy to follow the spiritual lead, but when it comes to the finances and planning for my future, my wife and I struggle. How much do we hold back to our future? How much do we put into our son's college fund? How much do we let go and let God do with as he will? Now, every time I put up a stone, I can very easily justify my actions by believing that God doesn't understand pensions and insurance because, after all, they've only existed for the last 50 years or so. They were not in the Bible. I cannot find a passage that talks about retirement or investments or money markets. But the hold of that argument is actually a cop-out. The stone that I'm putting in there, in place there, is I'm creating a barrier between trusting my future to God. The caring of me as the gray hairs continue to come into my beard. And the only reason why I know is because my son likes to count them on a regular basis. You can ask him, he's right there. But I don't move as easily as I used to move. If the doctor's telling me that I have to watch more things in managing my health. And my advisor is saying, well, you need to put a little more here and a little less there. And I sit there and go, oh my. I'm supposed to trust him, but God, okay, I'm going to trust him. It's a real struggle, and I'm not letting God work with what he has given me. And that's not only the home that I live in, the son that I have, the wife that he gave me, the home that we're part of, the places that I've worked. It is also... My future as well. How? Forget the how. That's the stone that I have, that I employ, that I am constantly putting in place and constantly trying to remove. But the stones that we have in our lives take many, many different forms. They may be stones of distrust, pebbles of sexism, the boulders of prejudice, or the granite of selfishness. Anything that stands in the way of going into the world, sharing the good news to make disciples of Jesus, or sharing God's love with others, presents us from having a life filled more abundantly. The stones are in place, and they need to be rolled away. Mary in this passage embodies the transformation that we are called, we are invited, we are prepared and asked to go through. From weeping before that tomb with sorrow, to standing before the risen Christ with no stones, no blinders, nothing to get in the way, and she now starts weeping for joy. She goes from a place of being confused and not understanding to having it click and getting it. The exact same opportunities are open to us in our journey with the risen Christ each and every day.
And because of this, we can experience neither the confusion or the joy that Mary does because we will keep focused on our stones more often. Let's roll them away and let our eyes be open so we can walk with hope, walk with joy, walk with love, walk with peace, and be able to be examples for the world to see that. When we roll away our stones, then we can see the beauty and the power and the wonder and the love that truly comes on an Easter morning when we celebrate that our Lord has risen. I love his enthusiasm. On this Easter Sunday, in this hour, in this place, as you take the elements of communion, as you continue to read and study God's word, have new eyes and new ears to hear and see the good news unfolding before you because you are letting the stones in your life that block you from God be rolled away. For when this stone is rolled away, joy truly elevates you. Peace truly calms you. Wisdom truly guides you. And being isolated and alone will never be part of you again. Because our Lord will walk with us. We teach that, we say that, but then we can feel it and experience it and share it with others in the world. And all this comes from a God who has power beyond imagination. A God who created the heavens and the earth. It is that power that sent his son into the world. It is that power who let his son be handed over and be scourged and crucified. It is that power that rose him from the grave. It is that power that ro rolled the stone away. And is that power that is promised to each and every one of us when Jesus becomes our Lord and our Savior. We are able to walk freely in this world, not with fearful, fearless arrogance, but with fearless peace. Our God is with us. And this is the day that we celebrate. That we walk not only every day in this world, but when the day comes that our life is over, we will be resurrected like our Lord, and we will walk for eternity in paradise. All of that is because our Lord has risen. He just keeps getting longer and longer on that, doesn't he? So let the Spirit work. If you've been struggling to give your life over, let go and give it over to God. If your commitment and covenant with God hasn't been what it used to be, allow yourself to renew it as you take communion. But you should be able to leave this place knowing that you have had an Easter celebration within this hour, and it doesn't have to stay here. It can be with you every hour, every moment of every day, because our risen Lord is with you. Happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter. Amen.